All right, great. So it's uh, wonderful to be back in Cambridge, as uh, always, and um, my first visit to the BHI. So this seems really a, like, uh, like a spectacular thing. Um, and I'm going to talk about, um, uh, uh, this is uh, not supposed to be easy to pronounce. It's supposed to sound like a swear word, the ephedron. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, you'll see what the subject is about. And this is a uh, work in progress. Hopefully a paper should appear uh, in not too long with uh, Yu Tin Huang, uh, who's a professor in Taiwan and is a former undergraduate student, now grad student at Caltech, uh, Tutu Huang. And um, I think maybe uh, I, I can begin by reminding you of, uh, of a sort of world view that certainly particle physicists had for uh, decades and decades, maybe most fundamental physicists had for decades and decades, uh, the world view of reductionism, that, uh, that the laws of nature are given most fundamentally at the shortest possible distances, and they're, they're given there, and of course, at various levels of hierarchies, uh, interesting things can emerge at longer and longer distances. And this is a very intuitive, and in the context of quantum field theory, was uh, uh, codified by the Wilsonian picture of the world. So again, there is some ersatz underlying fundamental theory, uh, but so that's great. On the one hand, on the other hand, uh, uh, the details of that theory are largely irrelevant at very large distances and uh, physics is controlled by a small number of uh, parameters, and the very high energy physics decouples. Uh, and uh, the effects of whatever's going on at very high, uh, high energies are in principle encoded, at least indirectly, in tiny corrections to low energy processes. But you wouldn't think there's much you could say about them from this general uh, Wilsonian picture of the world. It's a picture of the world that I like to uh, characterize as the world is like a crappy metal. <laughs> Okay, because that's uh, where it came from. It came from uh, understanding of condensed matter physics. And in condensed matter physics, there is such a picture of the ultimate underlying theory, of just Schrodinger's equation in that, in that case. And the details do indeed decouple. But it's, it's been clear for a long time, because of the physics of gravity and black holes, that this is fundamentally wrong for our universe. Okay, reductionism is just wrong. And we've known this for a long time. Uh, and it has everything to do with the physics of black holes and the sort of famous uh, fusion uh, between the physics of the ultraviolet and the infrared. These are sort of ancient things that we've known for a long time. We know fancier things now. But I want to just uh, uh, give some basic intuition why you might expect that, that, this, uh, that this expectation is false when it comes to the real world. Uh, and the basic reason is that very, very high energies no longer correspond to very, very short distances. If you collide things at very high energies, uh, you would start making bigger and bigger black holes as, uh, as the energies become much larger than the Planck scale. In other words, in a, in a crappy metal, very high energy, very short distance states really are unknown. We have no idea what they are until we go there, but that's not true in gravity. Very, once you have gravity, very, very high energy states turn into very, very large black holes and they start knowing something about the long distance physics again. So, uh, so that gives us some uh, just very rough indication that high energies uh, should have some impact on long distances. So maybe the physics of uh, the consistency of the ultimate theory does put some constraints on the structure of low energy physics. There are other famous examples of this sort. Holographic bounds on the number of degrees of freedom, for example, have this vague character to them. But I think it's fair to say that for a long time, most people thought that any such restriction on what the low energy effective field theory should look like would involve very, very subtle things, things like the black hole information paradox or where you're trying to measure exponentially tiny effects of the sort that Douglas was talking about, for example, and so on. Uh, and that so long as you were doing what looked like ordinary effective field theory, any old effective field theory would satisfy whatever these rules are, whatever these uh, magic mystery gravitational rules are. And I think around uh, uh, 12 years ago, um, a number of us started finding evidence that that might not be exactly true, okay? That there are interesting examples of what seem like naively perfectly healthy effective field theories that effective field theorists wouldn't blush at, which there are various indications cannot be embedded consistently into an underlying uh, a theory of gravity. And one early example was Uh, yes, absolutely. So that's 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 uh, that's 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 one qualitative example. I'm, I'm just uh, I'm uh, so I'm not saying these were the first examples, but but uh, we're, we're going to increasing degrees of sharpness. Okay. So all this business about global symmetries, as you know as, as well as I, could be violated by ridiculously exponentially tiny effects. So it's not really fundamentally different than what I was just talking about. Okay. At the level of exponentially tiny effects, everyone is, agrees 
funny things could happen. The violation of global symmetries could trivially be an exponentially tiny effect. What's interesting about these things is that they're not exponentially small things. There are perfectly reasonable looking effective field theories which are naively, uh, uh, which are uh, which are naively okay, and by not in fact that's, that's exponentially small, seem, seem to be in trouble. So I don't want to talk about this in any detail. One early example was this idea that gravity should be the weakest force of all, and there's not particularly uh, solid, but, um, but circumstantial reasons having to do with the consistency of uh, black hole physics for believing that, uh, that something like this uh, should be true. If you have electric forces and gravitational forces, there should always be some object in the world whose mass to charge ratio is smaller than that of an extremal black hole. But one thing I want to point out about this is that already this fundamentally gravitational statement has an avatar that uh, tells you something about uh, low energy effective field theory. One, uh, one way that this could be satisfied is if the higher dimension operator corrections to Einstein gravity had the feature of always pushing the mass to charge ratio for extreme of black holes down. Okay, and if that's true, that puts a specific constraint on the linear combination of higher dimension operators in the theory. You can go check in all examples where we know how to calculate in these things in string theory, you can check if it's right or wrong, and in every example that has been checked, it's been right. Okay, so there's already an interesting correlation between something to do with the consistency of black hole physics and some positivity statement, some combination of higher dimension operators have to have a fixed sign. Now, around the same time, another group of us found uh, other arguments that, uh, uh, where basic consistency of very high energy physics having to do with uh, the consistency, uh, having to do with fundamentally causality and unitarity, that causality and unitarity implies positivity. So for instance, if you imagine you have something like electrodynamics uh, with a higher dimension operator corrections that go like f to the fourth, and this would, uh, uh, an equivalent physical way of talking about this is to talk about the two to two scattering amplitude for photons, uh, which would have a piece at low energies that would be proportional to this constant, uh, proportional to the Mandelstam S squared plus C squared plus U squared, that this coefficient of just from consistency of unitarity and causality uh, is forced to be positive. And there's various ways of seeing this. One of them is purely at low energies. So if you imagine you have this and you turn on a tiny background with a minuscule magnetic field or a minuscule electric field, that doesn't break translational invariance, in that background, depending on the sign, uh, fluctuations can go either slightly faster or slightly slower than light. And if you demand that they always go slightly slower than light, you get uh, a restriction on the sign. The sign's got to be positive. And the same thing follows from, uh, from uh, arguments having to do with unitarity and dispersion relations that I'll actually review in a moment because we're going to be greatly generalizing them. Now, I want to point out that this is logically has nothing to do with gravity, uh, per se. It, it, it applies in a gravitational theory. It does not itself have anything to do with gravity. But the connection with causality, locality, and unitarity is clearly important for not messing up uh, black hole thermodynamics. So for instance, in one direction, if the signs were wrong, you could easily see that the effect of such a higher dimension operator would definitely push the mass to charge ratio for extreme of black holes in the, in the wrong direction. Sorry, I, I should have said this is bigger than zero. If the, sign has the, if the sign is wrong, the correction to the mass to charge ratio for extreme black holes would go up rather than down. So there's at least an interesting correlation between uh, things that have to do with protecting causality and unitarity, which of course should be important for horizon thermodynamics to make sense, uh, and, uh, and, and blackaholic arguments. Okay, so, so that's one set of arguments. And um, uh, I sort of uh, uh, moved on to think about a number of different things. Um, in seemingly totally unrelated developments in the past five or 10 years, a different notion of positivity has made uh, an appearance. And this one's quite a bit more radical. It's not, uh, in, in, in those cases, there is some underlying unitarity or causality and positivity is a derivative consequence out of it. In this story, it's totally different, and I'm not going to talk about it uh, uh, in, any, uh, in any detail, but what we've been seeing is that instead, some notion of positivity and fundamentally combinatorial geometric ideas that you can think of as living on the boundary of Minkowski space at infinity, there are some fundamentally combinatorial ideas that give you locality and unitarity out of some primitive positive notions. So it's not that positivity emerges from locality and unitarity, but the other way around. And this gives us very concrete examples we can study, you know, relevance to describing real experiments in the real world, where the physics of space, not just space, but space time, there are dynamical processes involving, for example, particle scattering amplitudes, both space-time and quantum mechanics, locality and unitarity 
are really seem to be derivative in these examples from some um, ultimately combinatorial ideas. Now, this, this set of uh, appearance of the words positivity and the first set appear to have nothing to do with each other. Just to give you some uh, words, um, uh, what, uh, for the second more, uh, the, the second more uh, radical set of things that have been uh, 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 happening, um, I've been seen in a few settings now. But we, we, we first ran into it around five years ago in an admittedly very special seeming uh, setting of uh, uh, the description of scattering amplitudes in the planar limit of the maximally supersymmetric uh, gauge theory for gluons. Although in the leading order approximation, this does indeed describe the scattering of gluons at the Large Hadron Collider. But more recently, we've seen these in much, a uh, much broader uh, set of theories that have nothing to do with supersymmetry. Uh, very simple cubic scalar theories, theories of pions, gluons, and any number of dimensions. And even in cosmology, uh, where instead of talking about the physics of scattering amplitudes, we talk, at least in perturbation theory, about calculations of what's pretentiously called the wave function of the universe. In all these cases, there is some computation that you normally do that uh, takes place inside space-time and uses all the apparatus of Hilbert space and quantum field theory. But there is another cousin object that is, uh, lives somewhere else that uh, positively geometrizes that. <laughs> all right, so that's the second appearance of the word uh, uh, positivity. And what I'd like to talk about today is motivated by all these things. We decided to go back and think about the first set of the words uh, appearance of the words positivity, and they turn out to be related to each other in an interesting way. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going back now, it's not quite as, so we're not, we're not replacing locality and unitarity now, we're going back to the old uh, arguments that told us that there had to be uh, positive signs and so on as a consequence of locality and unitarity, but the hint that uh, positivity had much more in it and could make locality and unitarity come out was enough of a hint to go back and look for more positivity back in the old story than, uh, than, than, we, than we suspect existed. And in fact, it does. And that's what I want to tell you about. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, this part of the story, uh, that there are indeed an infinite number of constraints on those tiny corrections in, in effective field theory. And those constraints tell you that all those numbers have to lie inside a positive geometry that is very closely connected to the amplihedron. It's not obviously, but closely connected to the amplihedron. So that's this effective field theory hedron. So this is a hidden positive geometry of causality and unitarity. It gives you certain universal predictions for any effective field theory, including predictions for quantum gravity in the real world. I'll show you plots for graviton, graviton scattering, photon, photon scattering, and so on, um, which are I mean, they're universally true, and particularly they're, they're true about, uh, about quantum gravity in the real world. I won't say anything about it, but to the uh, uh, cognoscenti, once you see what the ideas are here, you'll immediately suspect that something similar should be happening in conformal field theory. That's another place in the last 10 years where we've seen uh, some kind of interesting convex positive geometry, some kind of convex geometry in the program of the conformal bootstrap, and indeed, there's something very analogous to the, uh, to the EFT hedron, the CFT hedron, which is the positive geometry of the conformal bootstrap, but I won't have anything to uh, uh, say about that. That's uh, uh, also ongoing work with uh, uh, Shuang Xiao, who was a former student here. All right, so let me uh, tell you what, what we'll be talking about concretely. We're going to be talking about higher dimension operators in four particle scattering. So not all possible higher dimension operators, but the ones that show up in two to two scattering amplitudes. And what that means is that whatever the, the two to two scattering is, uh, I imagine there's some low energy scattering amplitude here. I'm imagining scattering particles of spin S. They could be Higgses, photons, gravitons. There's some piece out in front that you don't have to pay attention to that just encodes the helicity information. But there's a whole infinite series expansion in powers of the Mandelstam variables, S and T. All right? And those are the contact operators that, that encode what we normally call higher dimension operators. Okay, now let's, so I want, I'm, I'm gonna make statements about these guys. So let's, let's think about them in a little bit more, uh, uh, just to clean things up a little bit. Of course, a capital D here labels the overall dimension of the operator. So I'm gonna split this into two pieces, something that just has the overall units and something dimensionless. So, so, there's, so I have this whole sequence of numbers then, one for each uh, dimension of the operators. They have different units. And then these A hats are dimensionless things. There are sort of ratios of couplings uh, with the same dimension. It's very natural because I can, just because uh, these have units, I can rescale them arbitrarily so long as I rescale these guys in the opposite way. So these, these vectors can really naturally be thought of 
as, uh, as, as vectors in a projective space. That's naturally the way we should uh, think about them. Uh, otherwise said, we're only talking about ratios of these uh, variables to each other. All right? Sorry? I'm not going to, so, so uh, um, I'm not going to talk about, just for the sake of time, in this talk, I'm not going to talk, wow, I'm not going to talk about logs. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about all those issues later, uh, if you're interested. So, so yeah, so, so there's, uh, um, yeah, let's, let's ignore all the net. All right, but now I just want to give you the character uh, of constraint that we're going to give. On the one hand, these, all these t's, all these coefficients, are going to satisfy infinitely many nonlinear inequalities. So this formalizes the following intuition, that if you have some dimension 6 operators that are suppressed by 10 TeV, the dimension 8 operators should not be suppressed by a million TeV. They should all be suppressed by roughly the same scale. Okay, so that's one piece of intuition. Secondly, all of these dimensionless things, uh, they have to lie within very specific geometric shapes. Okay, so if you just imagine plotting those numbers, they can't be random. They have to lie within very specific polytopes. Right, so that's the character. And so this formalizes the intuition that if you have two dimension six operators, one of them can't be a million times bigger than the other. They should all be roughly suppressed by the same scale. And I should say that I'm talking about uh, things here that uh, where, where, where this is particle species AB goes to AB. So it's not breaking any symmetries or anything like that. Okay, so they're just generic uh, higher dimension operators. All right. So let me give you some flavor for why this is true. Uh, so uh, to begin with, causality and unitarity tells us something. And th this is a bit of a cartoon, and it's That's not yeah. True in nature, is it? Sorry, That's it is true in nature. There's some, some higher dimension operators that are suppressed more than they. Only, only when they violate symmetries. So that's 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 the point. Is that the uh, right? Symmetry. It could be accidental global symmetries. Yeah, but 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 everything that I'm talking about here satisfies even the accidental global symmetries. That's 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 the point. So I'm just talking about things where where where, where the two to two processes look like you know particle A B goes to particle A B. Anything other than that, uh, all bets are off. But uh, but but this does not violate even any putative global global symmetries. So this is a little bit of a cartoon. It's related to Daniel's. Uh, question, but but uh, uh, but uh, for the sake of brevity in the talk, uh, this will, will allow me to get to the main points as quickly as possible. Causality and unitarity tells you something about how you can express the scattering amplitude when when t uh, uh, when 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 t is sufficiently small and held fixed. Causality tells you that the amplitude has got to be bounded by a power of s. In fact, in detail, it's got to be bounded by s squared at very high energies. And that just that then tells you that the amplitude has an expansion. There are two pieces here called subtraction terms that take, take into account that it could, in principle, grow as fast as s squared as you go out to infinity. But the, the rest that's left must be expandable as a sum over poles. Okay? And there's a residue on the poles that can be expressed as a function of the cosine of the scattering angle on the poles. Now, the sum could be an integral. I could be talking about a one loop or a 10 loop uh, diagram, for example. That's just the dispersive representation. But the crucial thing is this, these simple poles in S. The simple poles in S is a reflection of locality. All right, so there are two positivities in the problem. There, there are two things that physics tells us are positive. One, all these mass squares are positive. The heavy particles are not tachyons. And two, uh, there's unitarity that tells us that when I sit on this pole, that residue has to be interpretable as the production of particles with positive probability. So you must be able to expand uh, this thing as, uh, as a function of cosine theta as a sum over some positive numbers that give you the probability of producing particles of uh, some spin s times Legendre polynomials of cosine theta. Or in general dimensions, they're called Gegenbauer polynomials, which is why I've called them g. So there are two things that are positive. m squared is positive, and the probabilities are positive. And those are going to have some implications on the structure of the low energy expansion. Because now I'm just going to expand this to low energies and powers of s and t. And the fact that that's positive and that's positive is going to put lots of constraints on what the coefficients in that expansion can look like. Now, those are the things that we already knew from ages ago. People have done this since the 1960s. Okay? And those are the obvious things that we talked about. In fact, even the things that we talked about 10 years ago were known to people in the 60s. Uh, and there are consequences of very basic, sort of uh, obvious, trivial to see features of uh, positivity. Uh, but um, before getting there, let me just give you uh, a picture for uh, how we're going to go about thinking about these things. 
in general, we have to solve the following kind of problem. We have some object that we care about that's expressed as a positive linear combination of a whole bunch of vectors. Okay? And this is just the subject of polytopes 101. Okay, so in the most trivial, uh, most trivial example, imagine you have a bunch of points on the plane, then all the points inside this polygon are in the form of some weighted sum of all the vectors where these coefficients are, po are positive. I promise it'll only take five, five more minutes, uh, although we'll have to negotiate that in a bit. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, we can say this equivalently projectively. Uh, it's better to say all these things by, by, by talking about these vectors, by going to one higher dimension and thinking about them as points in a projective space, these formulas become much more uh, elegant because we just have a positive linear combination of the vectors. So if you have a positive linear combination of a bunch of vectors, that tells you that these points live inside a polygon, in this case, or a polytope, really a cone. And this is known as the convex hull definition of, of a projective polytope. But let's say uh, you want to check if I hand you an A, is the A inside the polygon or not? This is a very useless definition for that purpose. What you'd like to do is give uh, the face description, in other words, to cut out this polygon by giving a bunch of linear inequalities that uh, satisfies it. And a very basic fact about polytopes 101 is that the facet structure of the polytope is completely captured by giving all these objects that are just determinants of the vectors uh, made up out of the projectivization of all the coordinates. So if you give me the information about the signs and zeros of all of these determinants for all the vectors, you've completely specified what this object looks like. All right? And so mathematicians have done this for you know, 50, 100 years, think about what infinite classes of uh, polytopes look like. There's a very special polytope, a very special polytope that's extremely in many ways. It's known as the cyclic polytope. And it's special for the following reason. First, it exists when you have a natural ordering for the vectors. So the simplest example is just points on a convex polygon on the plane, which are naturally ordered. If you go to higher dimensions, it's not so obvious how to order a bunch of points in, uh, in three or four higher dimensions, but you need an ordering for this notion to make sense. If there is an ordering, then the shape is fully specified by the requirement that all of these minors, all of these determinants made up out of consecutive uh, ordered vectors are positive, okay? So if I group all these vectors into a sort of capital D by N matrix, another word for this is to say that this matrix is totally positive or that it's in the positive Grassmannian. That's, those are just names. Uh, and, and the polytope, that's the convex hull of these guys, also has a name. It's known as a cyclic polytope uh, and is also the object that the simplest version of this object, the amplitohedron that I told you about that we ran into a number of years ago, the so-called k equals one amplitohedron. But the important point about uh, what makes this magical is that we know all the facets ahead of time. In general, it's not easy. If someone hands you a collection of vertices, you don't know what the facets are that go along with it. Um, or it's a lot of hard work to figure out what all the facets are. But in this infinite class of cases, we know exactly what the facets are. So what I want you to take away from this is when all the minors are positive, you know everything about this object. It's in a very canonical, extremal object. It has many remarkable properties that I don't have time to, uh, to uh, talk about. Okay, so let's go back to our problem. So why is there something new? The reason there's something new is that there turns out to be some hidden positivity in every feature of that formula for the four-point function. There's hidden positivity in the poles. Okay, just this dumb thing, that if you sum things that look like one over propagators with positive coefficients, there's some interesting hidden positivity in there. And there's some hidden positivity in these famous old Lejeune polynomials, the Gegenbauer polynomials, things that could have been noticed by mathematicians 150 years ago but weren't. Okay, there's some interesting positive, total positive structure in those guys. Okay, and so let me just sort of fly through this, um, but just give you a flavor for where this comes from. Uh, there's total positivity associated with locality. So here's the simplest version of this. Imagine I take the amplitude and I expand it, uh, even say I put t to zero, then, then everything I told you before just tells you that there's an expansion in terms with some positive coefficients of what looks like one over a propagator, which I, I can of course trivially expand out just by doing the Taylor series. But that tells me that all these coefficients have got to be expressible as a positive combinations of things that look like that, with sort of powers of one over m squared there, I apologize. Now, what we concluded many years ago and what people have concluded for 50 years is that all these things have to be positive. That's trivially true, but much more than that is true because they actually have to be in the convex hull of things that look like 1, x, x squared, x cubed, and so on. Now, this is a famous classic curve. 
Uh, it's called the moment curve, and it has a remarkable property that if you pick any set of ordered points on the moment curve, all the determinants are positive. Okay? Um, now, so there's a connection with total positivity. Now, it's a non-trivial statement because these things are continuous and we don't know what they are ahead of time. What property does this vector have to satisfy in order to be expressible in that way? And the answer turns out to be the following. Take all the, this is a, it's a non-trivial non fact. It's, uh, uh, we, we, we ran into it, and uh, our mathematician friends know it in various languages relatively recently. Um, just take this vector and make the following funny matrix out of it. It's called the Henkel matrix. Just A0, A1, A2, and so on. A1, A2, A3, and so on, okay? So just make this gigantic matrix. Then this thing comes from a sum over propagators if and only if all of the minors of this matrix are positive. All of them. So this one, that one, any k by k uh, minor for any k of that matrix is positive. So a little example, if, if I'm looking at these vectors in, uh, in two dimensions, uh, it's uh, being in the convex hull just geometrically clearly means that I just have to be inside that parabola. Uh, but being in that parabola is fully captured by writing this little two by two matrix and saying that this big minor is positive and the little minor is positive. Okay. So trivially, the old known fact is the statement for the one by one minors, but they're all positive. Okay. So that's the, that's the hidden geometry of uh, locality. And there's also a hidden positivity of unitarity. Okay. And here, if we look at the, these, uh, these famous Lejeune polynomials, uh, they are simply what you get by gluing together the amplitude for creating a, a spin s particle from the initial state and the final state. So it's trivial that when, this, when you're in the forward direction, this is the square of something and it should be positive. So that's the obvious positivity people have talked about for a long time. But there's much more positivity associated with it, which we can see if we do an expansion of this quantity around this forward limit where cos theta equals one. So if I collect all of the Taylor ex uh, expansion coefficients together, I can collect them in a big matrix. So here I've written down what they look like, at least for a, a few terms, for uh, normal Lejeune polynomials in three dimensions. The fact that the top row is positive is the obvious standard positivity that, uh, that it's a square of something. It was noticed by many people, going back to André Martin in the 60s, that in fact all the individual entries are positive. That has a relatively simple interpretation, uh, a, a very simple proof. But in fact, it's totally positive. That's the new observation. So all the minors of these Gegenbauer uh, polynomials are positive, and that tells you something. It tells you that if I take any number of rows of this matrix, uh, it lives in the positive Grassmannian, and that the convex hull of all those vectors is a cyclic polytope. Right? So that's sitting there in the structure of Lejeune polynomials, like nothing fancy, but was not, was, uh, not noticed by, by mathematicians. In fact, the case of Chebyshev polynomials, which are where these are cosines, uh, these functions are just cosine, was noticed by Mr. Chebyshev in the 1850s. <laughs> but the fact that it's true beyond that was not known as far as we know. So if I go back to the problem, and I'll just uh, I'll end just in a, in, a, in a minute. I just want to show you a couple of plots. Uh, what I told you before is that these coefficients have to satisfy infinitely many nonlinear inequalities. Those are exactly those Henkel matrix constraints uh, that I was telling you about. And these coefficients, if you just expand the formula I wrote for you before, you discover these coefficients have got to live inside those cyclic polytopes that are associated with the expansion of the Gegenbauer polynomials. And so this is what it looks like. Um, so just, just to give you an example of what's, what some of the constraints look like. Um, right, so this is for photon-photon scattering. So I'll only show you the constraints for the polytopes because the other ones are, are, are universal. Okay? Um, so for instance, if I talk about photon-photon scattering, and um, you don't need to look in too much detail about exactly what, uh, what amplitudes we're talking about. Z here is the variable S minus U. But anyway, uh, you discover already in the simplest case um, of the lowest dimension possible operators. Um, let me see if I can, oh, sorry. Already in the lowest case, where the space is just one dimensional, there's a specific limit. Okay, some ratio of two couplings has got to be bigger than negative 7 twentieths. Those numbers 7 and 20 come out of Lejeune polynomials. Okay, there, are, there are just facts about the three-dimensional world. But as we go to uh, higher dimensions, here is the two-dimensional picture. A certain ratio of, of three couplings have got to lie. They could, they could have, in principle, been anywhere, but they have to lie inside that specific shape. 
And there is analogous statements that are true for, I'll just, I, I'm really out of time. So that there, that's a three-dimensional geometry. You'll notice they're pretty skinny. Okay, so, it, uh, so, uh, so there are quite strong constraints on what these coefficients look like. I, I didn't uh, plot it here, but if you look at what you get, for example, from tree-level string theory or integrating up particles at one loop in, in effective field theory, they're always pretty close to some of the boundaries of these shapes for reasons that we don't totally understand. Um, and, and this is what you have for graviton. Graviton scattering, again, you have similar numbers that show up. Now 11, or 11 over 36 is some ratio of numbers. And you have very similar looking uh, shapes. Here are just various two dimensional. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You see they all roughly look the same. But all of these, uh, but there are specific sharp numbers that go along with all of those uh, facets that ultimately come from the uh, geometry of these Gagan bars. All right. So let me end. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's a story. Uh, you can actually think of this object as a simpler cousin of the amphitohedron. Reasons I don't have time to, uh, to explain, but you can, you can really write a formula for all the possible coefficients in a particular way as a positive linear combination of some positive, what you can think of as external data. These are given by the, these Gegenbauer uh, vectors that I just told you about, and these have to satisfy the nonlinear Henkel positivity constraints. And uh, there's a virtually identical formula for the amphitohedron. Okay, so once again, it's a nonlinear generalization of a notion of a polytope, where uh, the, the objects we talk about in the amphitohedron are also a linear combination of positive external data, but this satisfies a deeper kind of nonlinear Grassmannian positivity. And I'll end with a little uh, uh, funny story about Gelfand, the great mathematician Gelfand that, that, that I heard from some of my mathematician friends a little while ago. Gelfand apparently was going around in the 90s telling mathematicians who studied polytopes that you polytope people are doing trivial things all the time. What you should figure out is how to generalize polytopes into Grassmannians. Now, that's, uh, in other words, a nonlinear generalization of a notion of a polytope. And that's exactly what the amphitohedron is. And this new object, the EFTHedron, is somehow something in between, in complexity between polytopes and the amphitohedron. And this thing is really quite far away from, uh, from, from things that are familiar or even well understood even by our mathematician friends. So if the polytopes are a car, the eftahedron is like a jet, and the amphitohedron is like an intergalactic spaceship. Um, but still, uh, we're seeing similar structures show up, the same kind of positivity, now in a totally different part of physics, uh, giving us these universal constraints on low energy effective field theory. So, so the world is not a crappy metal. Okay, so that's, uh, um, if you had this Wilsonian picture of the world, you would definitely think, well, you can't say any, really anything about the higher dimension operators. It's totally contingent on all the random details of high energy physics. But it appears not to be the case. There's vastly greater, in, infinitely many ultraviolet constraints on infrared physics than naively expected. Uh, and uh, there's a lot to be thought about. Uh, can we include constraint, all the constraints that I talked about are only from causality and unitarity at high energies, we have not yet put in the direct constraint of, uh, of ultraviolet completion, softness of scattering amplitudes at fixed high energy. Um, and can we use these ideas to actually prove uh, that the shift in the mass to charge ratio of extreme of black holes always goes down, for example? There's various technical reasons why we can't immediately do it, which I'd be happy to explain later. But, but one might try to do something like that. And most speculatively, um, might this ancient dream that people have talked about for decades of some kind of UVIR correlation explaining the tininess of the cosmological constant, or maybe even the Higgs mass, might this have a prayer after all? These are words that people have said for decades, that somehow this, this deep correlation between the ultraviolet and the infrared might explain the cosmological constant problem. It always seemed like complete bullshit to me. <laughs> Um, but now I'm not quite as sure that it's complete bullshit as, uh, as, as I was before, simply because we're seeing many more tentacles of the ultraviolet coming down into controlling the structure of at least corrections to the low energy effective field theory. It's still a long way to go to correcting the leading pieces of, low, of the low energy theory, but it's at least not quite as absurd as it seemed before. All right, thank you very much. a little bit, do you still stay within the, the ephedron? Well, that's the, the, the point is that you have to, so uh, this is actually uh, slightly related to Daniel's question. So uh, here, here, Change them in the right way. Uh, well, here, here I talked about the higher dimension operator.
and I declared that the amplitude has these polynomials at low energies. Of course, higher dimension operators run. Everything runs. So right. I should be talking about the running high energy, right. uh, right. the, the, uh, the, the, the running. And that's related to the fact that the amplitudes are, in fact, not polynomials, but they have branch cuts that go all the way down to the origin from the massless loops at low energies. Yeah. Now, there's a totally precise way of talking about that and dealing with it, but the fast uh, summary is that the RG pushes you always further in to the FT drift. I see. Okay? So, uh, so wherever you are, the RG always pushes you further into the FT drift. And that's why, in order for this to give you a constraint on high energy physics, if there was no weak coupling in the ultraviolet at all, then, in fact, it's kind of meaningless to talk about the higher dimension operators, because they're dominated by the logarithms you get at low energies. Okay? And that's just a statement that if there's no weak coupling at all, where, wherever you start, the logs will push you in. Okay? But if there's any, any kind of weak coupling at, at high energies, then the starting point is big enough that you can't get pushed in by the running, and so you have a non-trivial thing to say. Okay, is it super quick? Uh, yeah, it'll be fast. So I have one already. Um, so, uh, so I, I really agree that it would be great if we could somehow put in these uh, constraint that it's sort of, you know, ridiculously high energies that the amplitudes actually uh, fall off. Right. Um, but, uh, well, I'm a little bit confused about what we can say about the analytic structure of amplitudes in that regime, because as far as I can tell, everything we know about the analytic structure of amplitudes pretty much is perturbative. Absolutely. We know yeah. nothing about the analytic structure of amplitudes. Even in, we know barely anything about it, even in perturbation. Theory. Yeah, that's right. So, so this, is, this, is not, and this is not a technical problem. It's a deep conceptual problem. Uh -huh. We don't know how time is reflected in the boundary. Okay? Yeah. So we, we, everything is great in ADS, um, but, uh, but it's a different kettle of fish when the boundary does not have a natural notion of time or causality. And so, yeah, so, yeah, of course, uh, you know, people complain all the time to, to, to those who are working on scattering amplitudes, oh, you're just doing things in perturbation theory, it's so boring and dumb. Well, we, we do the best we can, you know, that uh, we don't know the rules for something as basic as a causality. It's ironic that we know all these fancy schmancy things about Euclidean conformal field theories, well, but we don't know the most basic things about the real world. Well, how about if we regulate by going to ADS, would that help? Doesn't help. Yeah. Doesn't help. Mm -hmm. For various reasons, we, we could talk about it. If it helped, something so stupid helped, people would have done it. So, uh, so, so it's not, it does not help. Yeah. Okay, well with that, let's, uh, let's thank uh, both speakers again. Yeah.